So here's a problem uh, where we have a pulley. And in the past, we've uh, solved these pulley problems assuming that the pulley itself doesn't have any mass. But now we're going to acknowledge that pulleys have masses, and here's the details about that. So one of the things that that means is that the tension on this side, I'm going to call that T1, and the tension on this side, I'm going to call that T2, those tensions are not the same as one another. If, as in the past, uh, in the more simple problems, if the pulley has no mass and there's no friction, then the tensions do have the same value as one another, and it was a way that made the problem uh, easier. But now, in order to make this massive pulley rotate, in order to give it angular acceleration, uh, these two values have to be different from one another. And the way that that works is there also has to be some friction, some static friction between the rope and the pulley. And that friction kind of holds the rope onto the pulley, which allows there to be different tensions on either side. So, um, so that's something to be careful about in these problems, to recognize that the two tensions are not the same as one another. So here's what we're going to calculate those two different tensions and the acceleration of the system. Now everything is going to have the same acceleration because everything's tied together. Um, so that'll make things a little bit easier. Now you'll notice that we have three unknowns here and uh, that means that mathematically we have to have three separate equations in order to figure all three of those out. So here's where our three separate equations are going to come from. We're going to do just a, a acceleration equals net force over mass equation for the 5 kilogram, as we've done in the past. We're going to do one of those for the 10 kilogram, as we've done in the past. But then our third equation is going to be a torque equation for the pulley. So let's uh, take a look and see how these things come together. One other big caution with these problems um, is you have to be careful about direction, as we were in the past in pulley problems. Um, these things are tied together, but the pulley changes the direction of the motion. So you might remember in the past we just arbitrarily chose a direction to be the positive direction. We could do the same thing here, but I just think it's less confusing if we stick to the traditional idea that counterclockwise is positive. So if you use your right hand rule and turn that way, your thumb comes out. That's traditionally considered to be the positive direction. So if we do that, if counterclockwise is positive, it means that here on the left hand side, down is positive, and here on the right hand side, up is positive. So we have a consistent positive direction. This way, counterclockwise, is the positive direction. So I would recommend uh, using that direction uh, when you solve problems like this. So let's get started. First, with a free body diagram of each of these masses. So for the five kilogram mass, it has weight. Let's calculate that real quick. Five times 9.8 gives us 49 newtons. And just so I don't get confused, I'm just going to really put that positive sign there because on, on the left hand side, down is positive. Up, we have T1, and I'll put a negative sign there. In fact, I can even write the equation for that particular mass. So if we uh, input that to acceleration equals net force divided by mass, we would have acceleration equals 49 minus T1 divided by the mass of 5. That is one of the three equations that we're going to need in order to solve this problem. The second equation is going to come from the free body diagram of the 10 kilogram mass. So it has weight 10 times 9.8. It has a weight of 98 newtons. On that side, down is negative. And then there's T2 pulling up, and on that side, up is positive. So the acceleration equation, same, same uh, equation that we're going to input this information into, we have T2 minus 98 divided by the mass of 10. And there is the second of the two equations that we need in order to solve this. Notice that those two aren't enough because we have three unknowns, A, T1, and T2. So as I said, the third equation is going to come from a free body diagram of the pulley. And when you have rotation occurring, you can't simply draw a point as your free body diagram. You have to draw where the forces are being applied on the object itself. So on this side, we have T1 pulling down. And on this side, we have T2 pulling down. Of course, the center of rotation is right here. We can draw in the radius for each of those forces. And briefly, I'll mention that there are other forces acting on this pulley. For instance, it's a two kilogram mass, so it has weight. And the weight is acting right here at the center of mass. 
So technically you should draw those in. I think it just confuses the picture. I'm not going to draw them in because the weight acts right here at the axis of rotation. And so therefore it exerts no torque because part of the torque equation is radius. How far is the force from the axis of rotation? And for example, the weight vector is right there. It's right at the axis of rotation. So its R is zero, and so it doesn't exert any torque. Same thing is true. There's some sort of a force holding up the, uh, the pulley, whether you want to call that a normal force or a support force. But again, it's acting right at the axis of rotation, so it doesn't exert any torque. So I think it just confuses the picture. So I'll just leave it uh, like this. So now we're going to input these values into the equation alpha equals net torque over I. Again, that's just the rotational equivalent of A equals net force over M. In fact, it's called Newton's second law for rotation. So as I input the torques, let's start on this side over here. T1 would have a tendency to make this thing rotate uh, counterclockwise, and that's our positive direction. So the torque due to T1 is positive. Uh, torque is, you'll remember, radius times force times sine of theta. I'm not going to input the radius here. We know that it's 0.15, but lots of times in these problems, radius cancels out, and I want you to see that. So I'm just going to write R. Uh, the force is T1. The angle here is a 90 degree angle, so sine of 90, the angle between the radius and the force. Okay, moving on to the other side, T2 would have a tendency to make it rotate clockwise, which is the negative direction. So I'm going to do minus. Again, the radius is R. The force is T2. And once again, we have sine of 90 degrees because of that 90 degree angle between the radius and the force. Those are our torques. I'm going to divide by the rotational inertia. Now, they tell us that it's a solid disk. And so that allows you to look up the formula for the rotational inertia of a solid disk. There's a page in your textbook. I think it's 274 that has those values. You could look it up on the internet or any other reference force. It turns out for a solid disk, Rotational inertia is equal to one half the mass, the mass of this thing is two, times r squared. So that is our third formula. Now I'm going to simplify it a little bit. You know, th this two cancels out that two. Uh, this r and that r cancel out that squared. So let me rewrite this now. Alpha equals, uh, and of course the sine of 90 is one. So alpha equals t1 minus t2 divided by r. Now, we're actually, and of course we know what R is, but uh, let's wait a moment. Uh, you're going to see that it ultimately does cancel. Um, so we're, we're trying to get to the point where we have these three variables. And I've really just suddenly introduced another variable, alpha. Alpha is different than A. So technically we have four variables and we have a need for four equations. Uh, but the fourth equation is just an easy conversion. There is a conversion between uh, linear acceleration and angular acceleration. If you divide linear acceleration by radius, you get angular acceleration. So I'm now going to replace alpha with A over R. So if I put in A over R here, that equals T1 minus T2 over R, and the R's cancel out as I said they would, and here's where we end up, A equals T1 minus T2. That is our third equation. Three equations, three unknowns, the rest of this entire video is algebra. I could stop it right here because I'm sure you could do the algebra, but I'll give you a hint that I've noticed. Um, usually the torque equation has all three variables in it, so A, T1, T2. These equations each have only two of the variables in it. So I've noticed that if you solve each of these equations for the variable that they don't have in common, which is going to be the tension, solve each one of these for the tension. So um, here we would get uh, T1 is equal to, I'm doing this in my head, so I'm going to do this slowly here. I believe we're going to get 49 minus 5A. Uh, yeah, 49 minus 5A. And then over here, we're going to get T2 is equal to 98 plus 10A. So I solved each one of these for the variable that they don't have in common, or in other words, I've solved each one for the tension. Now you can input each of those into this equation over here. So we have A equals, and T1 is equal to 49 minus 5A, and T2 is equal to 98 plus 10A. 
And now the rest of this really and truly is algebra. Um, but I'll work that out uh, for us here. Maybe I'll do a couple steps in my head. I think on this side I'll gather the a's. So we have a plus 5a uh, plus 10a is what's going to be on that side of the equation. And then the numbers over here are 49 minus 98. So this all together is equal to 16a and this is equal to negative 49. So that allows us to calculate the acceleration. 49 divided by 16. So it's negative 3.0625. Negative 3.0625 meters per second squared. That's one of our answers. Um, real quick, it's negative. Does that make sense? Definitely. Because if you look back at our directions, um, downward on the left side is the positive direction. But you know, it makes sense with a 10 kilogram mass over here that it's actually going to move this way. It makes sense that it's going to accelerate in the negative direction. So I think we got the right answer here with that negative sign. So now let's figure out what the tensions are. It's just a matter of putting that A into these equations. So T1 is equal to 49 minus 5 times negative 3.0625. And uh, let's see what that's equal to. Um, 5 and uh, so 49, all right, 64.3125, 64.3125. Again, I'm going to ask myself, does that make sense? Because this number is greater than the weight of the object. This object weighs 49 newtons, and the tension on it is bigger than that. Well, yeah, that makes sense because it's accelerating in the upward direction. So um, I think we have the right answer there. And finally, T2 is equal to 98 plus 10 times negative... 3.0625, and if you work that out on the calculator, uh, 10 times 3.0625, I can't believe I actually did that on the calculator, it's obvious that that's 30.625, and then uh, nine, add 98 to that, I get 67.375, 67.375. Again, does this make sense? This tension is less than the weight of this object, but that makes sense because it's accelerating downward. Notice that these two tensions are fairly close to one another, but not exactly the same because they are creating some torque on the pulley.